welcome to the National World War II Museum's podcast series, Service on Celluloid. This podcast is brought to you through the generous support of the Albert and Ethel Hertzstein Charitable Foundation. This is our mini episode where I will hone in on some of the finer points from last week's main episode. My name is Seth Perrodin, historian and digital content manager here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, and today I'll be continuing our discussion on the 1977 film Cross of Iron. The film focuses on a German infantry platoon on the Eastern Front, specifically in the area of the Kuban Bridgehead in 1943 during the German retreat. Rolf Steiner is a combat-hardened veteran of many campaigns, and he leads his platoon through the hell of the Eastern Front. His main goal is keeping as many of his men alive as possible. Steiner's real enemy, however, is not the Soviets, but the aristocratic Prussian officer named Stronsky, who only seeks to glorify himself and do something heroic enough for which he would be awarded the Iron Cross. Cross of Iron stars James Coburn as Steiner, Maximilian Schell as Stronsky, James Mason, David Warner, and many others. Film was directed by Sam Peckinpah, written by Julius Epstein, James Hamilton, and Walter Kelly. Cross of Iron received mixed critical reviews at the time of its release, but has since been viewed as both an important and well-made film. Now, the war on the Eastern Front, that of course being the war between Germany and the Soviet Union, was a war, a W-A-R, until at least that time that had never been seen before in modern times. Wars are by nature destructive to everything. Soldiers, civilians, environment, everything. But the war in the East was a war of extermination, started by the Germans and finished by the Soviets. The Nazis and the Soviets were the ultimate enemies. The ideology of National Socialism was inherently against anything communist, and vice versa. In the days before the Nazis took control of Germany, through a vote, mind you, they battled the communists openly in the streets of Germany from the 20s through the 30s. Part of the Nazis' rise to power was based on the German fear of communism, and the Nazis pledged to erase communism and communists from Germany altogether. Hitler and the other Nazi propagandists were highly successful in directing the population's anger and fear against the Jews, against the Marxists, those are communists and social democrats. Much of Hitler's propaganda before and after taking power was against the communists and the Jews. So it was a shock to the entire world when in 1939, August 1939 to be exact, the two mortal enemies signed a non-aggression pact. The pact had two parts. An economic agreement signed on August 19, 1939 provided that Germany would exchange manufactured goods for Soviet raw materials. Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union also signed a 10-year non-aggression pact on August 23, 1939, in which each signatory promised not to attack the other. <laughs> I laugh because it's so ridiculous. Now, what the other countries of the world didn't know is that the pact contained a secret clause that said that when Germany invaded Poland, the country would be divided up between Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany. So it was that in the autumn of 1939, half of Poland, a little less than half actually, was occupied by the Soviets as well as the Nazis. And a lot of people don't think of that. They don't know that. They think you know, on the 1st of September 1939, the Nazis roll into, German, I mean, into Poland and they take over the whole country. Well, they didn't. Uh, the Soviets also took over part of it as well. All that being said, it was still a shock to the free world when the two ideological enemies made sudden best friends and split up territories between each other. Remember when I said that the non-aggression pact had a 10-year, quote, no attack, unquote, clause in it? Well, old Adolf wasn't one for sticking by his own rules, as past history had shown us. So it was on June 22, 1941, that the Germans launched Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. The invasion marked the beginning of one of the bloodiest wars in human history. As I've said before on this podcast, there was no quarter asked and no quarter given on either side. The actual hatred between the two enemies can be seen in one actual given order, honest to God, order. Shortly before the invasion of Soviet Russia, the Nazis issued the infamous Commissar Order. Political commissars were Soviet Communist Party officials who oversaw its military units and reported directly to party leaders. Operating as they did outside the military, military hierarchy, commissars acted as a conduit from the party to the ranks of the ordinary soldiers, transmitting political propaganda and preventing dissension. To the Germans, commissars represented the true, quote, pillars of opposition, unquote, the link between the Bolshevik ideologies and the minions in the military who helped the, who the Nazis believed fought blindly for Bolshevism. For that reason, German soldiers were ordered to shoot any political commissars who were taken prisoners. The commissar order reads in part, 
When fighting Bolshevism, one cannot count on the enemy acting in accordance with the principles of humanity or international law. In particular, it must be expected that the treatment of our prisoners by the political commissars of all types who are the true pillars of resistance will be cruel, inhuman, and dictated by hate. The troops must realize, one, that in this fight it is wrong to trust such elements with clemency and consideration in accordance with international law. They are a menace to our own safety and to the rapid pacification of the conquered territories. Two, that the originators of the Asiatic barbaric methods of fighting are the political commissars. They must be dealt with promptly and with the utmost severity. Therefore, if taken while fighting or offering resistance, they must, on principle, be shot immediately. The commissar order was shocking to the Germans, but not surprisingly, still complied with by both the Wehrmacht and the SS troops, both on the front lines and behind them. The order was rescinded in 1942 by Hitler, but the damage had already been done. The fighting on the Eastern Front was brutal. Prisoners of war were captured by both sides literally in the millions. By war's end, the Soviets had captured over three million German soldiers. Three million. Estimates are as high as over one million German soldiers dying in Soviet captivity. The records of the NKVD state just over 300,000 dying in Soviet captivity, but the numbers of missing German troops and POWs just don't add up, and 300,000 is a paltry number considering the source. The figures for Soviet prisoners taken by the Germans is absolutely astonishing. It is estimated that over 5 million Soviets were taken prisoner by the Germans from 41 to 45. Over 3 million of them died in German hands. Unreal. Now, our movie Cross of Iron doesn't get into the POW situation into too much detail. Stronsky does order that the Russian child POW be, to be shot by Steiner, but that is the only time that any kind of mistreatment of POWs is mentioned or implied in the movie. Of course, one could make the argument that the film isn't about that, and it isn't. But that fact, the fact of almost certain death at the hands of your enemy, was certainly on the minds of every German soldier on the Eastern Front. Soviet or German, honestly. Guaranteed. What the film does show, however, and in great detail, is the wholesale slaughter of the fighting on the Eastern Front. And I think that is something that people here in the West, unless you have studied that particular part of World War II, have absolutely no clue about. American, British, Canadian, Australian casualties were high in the war, no doubt. And no death of any Allied soldier is to be or ever will be taken lightly. But hear me out on this. They pale in comparison with numbers on the Eastern Front. For example, let's take the Battle of the Bulge. The Bulge was and still is the largest single battle ever fought by the United States Army. It occupies an enormous spot in our collective memory on the Western Front of World War II, rightfully so. The battle began on December 16, 1944, and by January 16, 1945, over 700,000 Americans were entangled in areas and fighting which would later be classified as the Battle of the Bulge area. Of those 700,000 plus, over 88,000 Americans would be casualties. That includes killed, wounded, and missing in action. Huge numbers, staggering numbers, really. 88,000 human beings, 88,000 Americans. Look at Okinawa largest battle of the Pacific War. From April 1st, 1945 through June 22nd, 1945, and this includes Army, Navy, Army Air Forces, and Marine Corps personnel, over 180,000 combatants fought in the Okinawa campaign. Estimates for those killed in action range anywhere from 18 to 20,000 dead and 55,000 wounded. Again, staggering numbers by any means. But when you compare those numbers to the Titanic struggle on the Eastern Front, it's almost unfathomable. Stalingrad. At its peak, over one million German soldiers are engaged in combat. Over one million Soviet soldiers are engaged in combat. One million per side. Through the entire course of the fight, Germany and her allies lose somewhere between 650,000 and 860,000 men killed in action. The Soviets lose somewhere between 1.1 million killed and 650,000 wounded or incapacitated in some way. The simply, it's simply mind-boggling, really. And that's just one battle. The siege and fighting around Leningrad. Germans lose over 570,000 people. The Soviets lose, get this, over 3 million people. 3 million. 
Totals for the entire German-Soviet war vary wildly. No concrete accurate numbers actually exist. Why, you ask? Simple answer. There were so many people killed that the governments simply lost count. Think about that for a minute. Estimates for German losses on the Eastern Front vary, but hover around 5 million combatants killed in action. That's just the Eastern Front. The Soviets lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 9 to 10 million killed in action. That does not count the over 23 million civilians who were killed in the war on the Eastern Front. The numbers are just that. They're numbing. Mind-numbing. To imagine that kind of human suffering on such an enormous scale is something that we as Westerners have an extremely difficult time wrapping our minds around. That is simply because we have never experienced anything like that before. And for that, we should be eternally grateful and hope to God we never do. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to tune in next week when we discuss the 1943 film Guadalcanal Diary. Until then, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Service on Celluloid. Be sure to rate and review us on Stitcher or iTunes if you like what you hear. I'd like to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, our producer, Mallory Kirk, and our sound engineer, Jeremy Burson. This has been a production of the National World War II Museum.